Maybe a kind of brief lesson today, although it seems like every time I say that, it isn't. But we skipped chapter three. Uh, we skipped a lot of chapter two, for that matter. I didn't really comment on it. Um, We're going to just introduce selected bits of this chapter today. So chapter three is all about determinants. So a determinant is a number. This isn't a kind of weird way of saying it, but a number assigned to a square matrix. So every square matrix has a number called a determinant. And once upon a time, determinants used to be really the focal point of linear algebra classes, and they've had a pretty radical fall from grace. I mean, determinants are hard to define, or not so much hard to define as the definition is some weird inductive thing, and it's hard to see why anyone would care about them. And most of their applications are like in graduate level classes. So it, it's sort of hard to motivate at this level. And I think that's that's accounted for sort of their fall from grace, as it were. But we are going to use them a little in this class, in particular in chapter five, which is why we're doing them now, right after chapter four. So we're going to just say as much about these as we need to say. Um, so if you have a matrix A, the determinant is written either debt A or if you have, you know, you have the array and you have the numbers and you want to say, I'm going to take the determinant of this matrix one, two, three, four. You can write the matrix, but the brackets change to vertical line segments. Um, these are both notations for the determinant of A. And we are going to define the determinant of A inductively. And it starts off not so bad. If A is a two by two matrix, the determinant of A is gotten by multiplying the diagonal elements, multiplying the anti-diagonal elements, and subtracting them on the off chance that anybody remembers the uh, the equation for the inverse of a two by two matrix, 
that AD minus BC should be familiar. It shows up in the denominator of a fraction in that equation. So for the determinant of a three by three matrix, we're already B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. So this definition, we're going to make a bunch of choices when we find the determinant of a matrix. And I won't prove this, I'll just say it, the choices we make don't matter. I mean, it, you can think of it as adding fractions where you have to choose a common denominator, but the specific common denominator you choose isn't going to uh, affect the outcome. So, To start with, we need to choose a row or a column. And sometimes there are rows and columns that are better to choose than others. But for now, we're going to just do this at random. Um, let's select the third column. We are now going to define the determinant or we're going to partially, partially define, undo, undo, undo. We're going to start defining the determinant. Uh, I said this to someone before class that Zoom updated their whiteboard and now the eraser just erases stuff completely at random, hoping for a quick fix on this one. Let's see, so we circled that last column and for every matrix, we can construct something called a sign chart. And you don't have to create the entire sign chart, and we ordinarily wouldn't. But a sign chart for this three by three matrix is a three by three grid with pluses and minuses on it. And we start with a plus, and then we alternate plus, minus, plus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. And we're going to take these numbers in the column we've circled, and we're going to attach pluses and minuses to them according to the sign chart. So this C in the upper right gets a plus attached to it. Let me silo this off. This F in the second column last row gets a minus attached to it. Notice that I'm leaving space between these because we're going to put other stuff here as well. This I in the third row, third column, gets a plus attached to it. And now, so we're going to add something, subtract something, add something. 
thing. And I mean, I said this before, but ordinarily, once you've decided the row or the column, you don't need to write the sign chart down. We just say, well, we start positive in the upper left, then alternate. Positive, negative, C is positive. We alternate, F is negative, I is positive. But we are uh, going to multiply this C, this minus F, and this I by something. And we're going, in particular, we're going to multiply them by determinants of smaller matrices. C times a determinant minus F times a determinant plus I times a determinant. And here's where it would really help to have a functional eraser. Um, so we'll start with C. C times a determinant. What determinant? Okay, I'm just going to do this and it will turn out how it turns out. Well, we've got this C in the upper left. We scribble out or we cross off in your notebook, the road that C belongs to. And then we cross out or cover up the column that C belongs to. And then we cross off the row and the column that C belongs to, we see we have numbers in a grid, D, E, G, H. And we're going to take the determinant of those numbers that are left when we cross out the row or the column containing C. And now, Other thing. Okay, let's see. Is it related to the clock part? Uh, it has similarities to the cross product. Yeah, with the cross product, you cross columns out, and then you do this with the remaining entries. So yeah, it, it's definitely similar. Okay, so F, and I'm not going to repeat that experiment with our eraser busted, but, well, maybe I can, because the undo tool presumably works. So for F, we cross that row out, we cross that column out, and now we have four numbers in a two by two grid, A, B, G, H. There we go, that's how to do it. And for that I, we cross out the column and the row, containing I, we have four numbers in a grid, A, B, D, E. So we've got C times a determinant minus F times a determinant plus I times a determinant. And at this point, these determinants are, are not so bad. The determinant of a two by two matrix 
is two products and subtraction. So the determinant of a three by three matrix is kind of tedious, but it's not the end of the world. I mean, basically, as soon as you get bigger than three by three, I mean, I do four by four if you held my family hostage, but by the time you're at five by five, because consider what happens as you increase the sizes of this matrix. If you want the determinant of a four by four matrix. And the process is the same. You select a row or a column, let's say the third row. You count, I mean, you. Can, I'm not going to write down the sign chart. I'm just positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. So we'll have plus i times a determinant minus j times a determinant plus k times a determinant minus l times a determinant. What are all of these determinants? Well, for example, the first determinant, You'd cross out the column containing I, and you'd cross out the row containing I. And what you'd have left is a three by three grid. And then for J, you do the similar, K similar, L similar. And so now you have these four determinants you have to find. All four of these determinants, they're three by three matrices. So we have to go back here and we have to do this work four times. I mean, once you got to five by five. I mean, you can see that this is, is going to get out of hand very quickly. I mean, in point of fact, um, if A is N by N, it takes N factorial operation to find the determinant of A. So when I say operations, I mean flops, if that means anything to you, addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division. And I mean, to put this into context, if you perform five operation per second, finding the determinant of a 12 by 12 matrix, will take about three years. So 
another reason, you know, this stuff sort of not in favor in practice, you I mean, you can, because this is a classroom, we can just decide we're only going to look at examples where the matrix is really small, maybe three by three at a maximum. But I mean, this method clearly gets uh, gets out of control very quickly. I mean, even if you're using a computer, a computer will perform far more than five operations per second. But also, I mean, a real world matrix might be 500 times 500. Like if you're taking, if you're, you know, performing scientific operations and you've got this multi-year outpost, you know, these outposts that record matrix, not matrix, earthquakes and stuff. And they've got these vast data sets and they go into matrices and, and clearly you can't do this with a vast matrix, even with the aid of a computer. Um, the only kind of saving grace of determinants is if you have a sparse matrix, they're not so bad to find. Sparse is a a rare beast. It's a mathematical phrase that mathematicians use and which no one has a really formal definition for. But the informal definition is that a matrix is sparse if it's mostly zero. Um, and a lot of very important real world matrices are sparse. So for example, the Google search algorithm, I mean, I don't, they, they seem to have done something to it. It's, it's practically non-functional now. But at one point, at least, the Google search algorithm worked like this. You took every page on the internet. And for every page on the internet, You defined a row and a column. And then if there's a hyperlink from one page to another, you put a one in the matrix. And if there's no hyperlink, you put a zero. So this is a huge matrix, like a billion by a billion or whatever it is, but it's almost entirely zero. Because, I mean, if you take two random web pages, it's extremely unlikely that there will be a hyperlink between them. So anyway, what I was saying is that if you have a sparse matrix, Then even a relatively large determinant, you can maybe deal with in a relatively painful way, painless way. And what you do is you'd, you'd um, when we Fine. When we select a row or a column, we say we're going to expand along that row or column. What you try to do is select rows or columns 
with a bunch of zeros in them. So what if we expand along that um, fourth row? Well, we get positive, negative, positive, negative zero times something, plus zero times something, minus zero times something, plus zero times something, minus one times something. And the key observation is that zero times anything is zero. So this is zero times a determinant, zero times a determinant, zero times a determinant, zero times a determinant, but it doesn't matter what those determinants are because we're multiplying them by zero. The only thing that matters here is this last entry, this minus one times a determinant. So we have is really really silly i don't i don't remember what i what i had did anybody did anybody write down what the first row here was one zero zero two one thank you so we can expand along the third row We get minus one times a determinant. In particular, we get minus one times this determinant. And now to find this determinant, we can expand along the second row. And again, the point of expanding along a row that has a bunch of zeros in it is that zero times a determinant is a zero. So the more zeros you have, the fewer determinants you have to find. This, if we expand along the second row, it's minus zero times a determinant, plus zero times a determinant, minus one times a determinant, plus zero times a determinant. And again, you know, we don't need to find the determinants that are being multiplied by zero because they're going to go away anyway. And we end up with zero drawings. We end up with, we have that negative one. Then we have negative, positive, we have another negative one. We've got the determinant that we get when we cross off this row and this column. And none of the other determinants matter because they're being multiplied by zero. Then one, zero, two. Two zero two uh zero zero one and well this this last one is is super easy as a matter of fact we'll expand along that second column everything in the second column is zero. So we have negative one times negative one 
then a positive negative zero times a determinant plus zero times a determinant minus zero times a determinant. Well, this is all zero at the end of the day. This worked out very nicely and very quickly. We ended up with a determinant of zero, but we were only able to do that by hand because it was so sparse that we were able to expand along these rows and columns that were almost all zeros in practice. Let's see, I mean, we can, let's do an example. You should get the same answer no matter what row or column you get. Yeah, it, it's purely a matter of, of trying to do as few operations as possible. Like if you expanded along that row as your first step, you'd have two times something, negative two times something, and one times something. So you wouldn't be able to ignore, you'd have three determinants that you had to find, as opposed to when we expanded along the fourth row where we only had one determinant that we had to find. Finding the determinant is what we call a well-defined process. And that just like you said, it doesn't actually matter from a mathematical point of view. It's just that sometimes a row or a column is easier than the others. So here we don't have anything as extreme in the last example, but also we have a much smaller matrix. So this shouldn't be too bad. I use either the first row, the third row, or the first column, just because those are the ones that have a zero in them. Let's use the first row. One, times the determinant of one, four, one, two. Again, we're crossing out the row and the column on a piece of paper, you'd be covering it up or doing something less drastic but we cover up or cross out the row or the column that has the one in it. And we're left with that little matrix one, four, one, two. Then in terms of the sign chart, we always start with positive in the upper left. So it's going to be minus zero and I'll write the determinant, but we're not going to find it. Minus zero times the determinant of the matrix you get. If you cross out that row and that column, plus two times one, one, zero, one, the determinant of the matrix you get when you cross out that row and that column. So, not, I mean, zero times anything is zero, so there's no motivation for us to worry about that second determinant. And then now these are determinants that we can, we can find in our heads or at least without too much difficulty. Two times one is two, four times one is four, two minus four is negative two. One, 
one times one is one, one times zero is zero. These are the products I'm doing, the diagonal and the anti-diagonal. One minus zero is one. Huh. And for the second time in a row, this matrix that I randomly came up with had a, a determinant of zero. That's, uh, that's an interesting coincidence because having a determinant of zero means something special. Let's get on to that. And in fact, I'm just going to say the theorem and then we can sort of talk about why it's true. Now, there are a few theorems we should talk about. I guess. But here's the main one. A square matrix A is invertible if and only if the determinant of A is not zero. So unless I, I did something drastically wrong when I found this determinant, this three by three matrix I came up with at random has no inverse because we found an impermanent and it ended up being a zero. Let's, and I know I say don't find inverses, but our calculator should be able to handle a three by three matrix. Let's take a look. just as soon as our calculator loads. So I'm not screen sharing at the moment. So anyone watching this recording isn't seeing anything. But I will after I get the matrix entered. So here's A. E, let's see if we can find an inverse. And just like we predicted, we did not make mistakes. We get an error when we try to find an inverse. It says the matrix is singular. That's terminology I haven't used in a while. I usually just say invertible or not invertible, but we may remember that singular matrices are matrices with no inverses. Probably somewhere in this matrix menu. In fact, the very first thing is a debt button. So our calculator will find determinants for us. Now I'm kind of curious uh, how five by five. Yeah, how big I can make these things before our calculator starts. Yeah, that's indulgent curiosity. Is there not a way? There should be a way. But I don't know if there is. Rand make tricks and 
it doesn't want that. Brand matrix 10, comma, and Okay, so here's a, make a randomly generated matrix. Let's store this into A. And now let's see if our calculator wants to find the determinant of a 10 by 10 matrix. Oh, not bad at all. <laughs> Two years. Yeah. At this point, I am just kind of messing around, but my curiosity is peak. It does not want to create a hundred by hundred random matrix. <laughs> what about a fifty? by 50 random matrix. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't have enough memory even to store a 50 by 50 matrix. Never mind. Do anything with it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, the the issues we're running into here aren't so much that the determinant's taking forever as that generating the matrix is too hard for our calculator. Let's see. Okay. And this, I, I think the re, I think this is like you see, e, this is a very big determinant, like E23. So, I mean, this is not the determinant. This is the determinant heavily rounded to the closest, whatever, the closest trail, that not even trail. And so, I think the calculator is able to do this because at some point it just starts heavily rounding everything and ignoring the finer details. That ended up being a bit of an aside. So back to this, here's this theorem. It, we verified that at least with this matrix, the theorem is true. Um, it's, it's really hard to show proofs of anything involving the determinant, just because the definition of the determinant is so bizarre and so messy. I mean, even like writing down like it's some kind of alternating, even writing the determinant of an arbitrary matrix would be hard to do. The, um, the two-minute summary of the proof is as follows. Theorem. Performing... An elementary row <clears throat> operation on a matrix either. does not change the determinant or it flips the sign of the determinant. It makes negative determinants positive and vice versa. 
or it multiplies the determinant by some non-zero number. And I, I underlined non-zero because it's very relevant to the next theorem. Let's call it a corollary. If the determinant of A equals zero, and we perform Gauss-Jordan elimination on A, the determinant of the new, that is to say, the row reduced matrix is still zero. And similarly, if the determinant of A is not zero, blah, blah, blah. We perform Gauss-Jordan elimination on A. Then the determinant of the new row-reduced matrix is still not zero. And again, I call it a corollary because it comes immediately from this theorem. If the determinant is zero and we either don't change it, flip it sign, negative zero is still zero, or multiply it by some number, zero times any number is still zero. None of these uh, elementary row operations can take a determinant of zero and make it not zero. And similarly, none of these row operations will take a determinant that isn't zero and make it zero. That's why I underlined the fact we might multiply the determinant by a non-zero number. We might take a determinant of five and multiply it by one seventh and get five sevenths but we won't multiply it by zero. So it will never be a zero. And the reason this is significant, I guess it's, I guess it's really just half of the proof because this is an if and only if statement. But if A is invertible, and if we take A and we perform reduced row echelon, gosh, the calculators really poisoned my vocabulary. I, I, I just get sick of writing perform Gauss-Jordan elimination. But if we perform Gauss-Jordan elimination on A and A is invertible, we get R. Well, as it happens, the determinant of the identity matrix is always one. Let's look at the four by four. identity matrix. And, and the way to get one, it's really straightforward if you understand this determinant process. 
So expand along the first row, we get row, we get one times the determinant of this matrix. And then nothing else that matters. One times this determinant minus zero times something, that doesn't matter. Plus zero times something, that doesn't matter. Minus zero times something, that doesn't matter. So now we have this three by three matrix. We'll expand along its first row. We get one times this determinant and then some other stuff that doesn't matter. Um, zero times something, zero times something. And then uh, we have the determinant of one, zero, zero, one is one. It's one times one and zero times zero. One minus zero is zero. So we have one times one times one equals one. And any identity matrix would work out this way. So for our purposes, the one it doesn't matter so much. As the fact that it's not to zero. Um, the determinant of the identity matrix is one, therefore it's not zero. Therefore, the determinant of A is also not to zero. So that's half of this if and only if statement. If the determinant is not to zero, the matrix is invertible. And I mean, I guess it's also, right? no, if the matrix is invertible, then the determinant is not to zero. The other way would be if the determinant is not zero, the matrix is invertible. And that's a little fuzzier. But this is the major theorem of determinants. This is what we're going to be using when we get to chapter five. It's, um, it's a very theoretical result. This is not a good way of deciding whether a matrix is invertible or not. I mean, finding the determinant is much slower than five, than just hitting the matrix with Gauss-Jordan elimination. And you can decide whether a matrix is invertible with Gauss-Jordan elimination. You perform the elimination, and if you get I, it's invertible, and if you don't, it isn't. So... This is not being presented as a way to decide whether a matrix is invertible or not. There are better ways to decide whether a matrix is invertible. Be that as it may, it is something we will use in chapter five. I mean, I guess I presented sort of the the climax of this chapter. So now we just have kind of a few scraps to get into our notes. Um, the determinant, this theorem, if nothing else, will give us an excuse to define triangular matrices, which can be important. The determinant of a triangular matrix 
and I'll put uh, an asterisk here. We'll give a definition of this in just a second. So the determinant of a triangular matrix is the product of its diagonal elements. So a matrix is triangular if either all the entries above the main diagonal or all the entries below the main diagonal are zero. So I mean, why triangular? Well, because if you look at the, the non-zero elements, they are making up a right triangle. Um, similarly, if all of the entries below the main diagonal are zero. And again, you just, I mean, it's a very, sometimes names in mathematics seem like absolute nonsense, like normal is a word that gets used. Why, why are angles normal if they're at right angles? Well, it's just the word we use. This word is very uh, natural by contrast to that. So um, the determinant of that first matrix is one. All of the entries on the diagonal are one. We multiply them together, we get one. The determinant of the second matrix is 14. Seven times two times one is 14. And I mean, the proof of this is just if you have a triangular matrix, you either have a row or a column, or in fact, both a row and a column where there's only one non-zero entry. So, take our life in our hands and use the eraser tool. So finding the determinant of this, we'd expand along this first row and we get one times, let me make something here not be one. I was not trying to erase that, but it's what the tool decided to erase. Let me make that last diagonal element be three. So we expand along the first row, we get one. And this is the only entry that matters. One times this determinant, and then minus zero times something, plus zero times something, minus zero times something, the somethings don't matter. Expand along this. I mean, the key, the key observation here is that if we have a triangular matrix like this and we remove the first row and the first column, we still have a triangular matrix. One, zero, seven, three, 
Another way to think about this is if we think of the determinant of a one by one matrix as being just the entry in the matrix, then we can actually keep going. We expand along the first row again. We get one times one times one times the determinant of this one by one matrix. This notation is clearly terrible for one by one matrices because it looks like the absolute value. Fortunately, three was already positive. Um, one times one times one times one times three. The product of the elements of the diagonal, precisely as we said. <clears throat> so that that's nice. Uh, you do have, will we talk about them? We might talk about them. Some pretty significant uh, applications and results dealing with diagonal matrices. I think during chapter five, we're going to want this. So I'll just, again, it's just kind of a stray theorem, but I'll state it to, to conclude the class. It's kind of amazing. I mean, if you consider what an absolute bizarre mess the definition of the determinant is. It's kind of astonishing that it has any nice properties at all, but it does have this property that the determinant of a product is the product of the determinant. And that's what we need out of chapter three. Yeah. I mean, there's other stuff in there trying to make the determinant seem a little less alien, I guess. Like you can think of the determinant as having something to do with volume. But I, I, I don't think any of that's really important for our purposes. Just presented what we needed. So next week, the test will be, there's, uh, I, I put an old test on Canvas, all that stuff I just dump in the announcements. Um, that old test, we went at a slightly different pace. So there was no inverses or stuff on it that will be on Thursday's test since it wasn't on the chapter one test. And Tuesday, we'll, we'll lecture as normal, start a new chapter. I will see you then.